Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming today, this morning. My name is Jody Radke. I am a Regional Advocacy Director with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. I also wear an alternate hat to that. I am the co-chair of the Keep Michigan Kids Tobacco-Free Alliance. I am joined in the room today by my other co-chair, an esteemed pediatrician, Dr. Brittany Taylor, a pediatrician here in Michigan, and a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She chairs the alliance with me. For those who are not familiar with our organization, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, we are the leading advocacy organization that works on policies to prevent kids from starting use of tobacco and to ensure that our adults have resources should they choose not to use tobacco as an adult later in life. And we work here in the US, but we also work um, internationally on this issue. This is our first time actually here on the island and as a sponsor of this conference, and we couldn't be more excited and thrilled to be here and to really um, communicate our investment in Michigan to bring Michigan from last, in many cases, you'll hear some of the data points that I'll share with you today, from last to leader. Um, Michigan used to be a leader in tobacco control policies, and over the last decade or two, Michigan has lost a lot of ground. And so we're looking to reclaim that narrative and to put Michigan up front and center in terms of prioritizing kids over, over profits. So um, before we get started today, one thing I did want to um, just mention is that I'd like to have shared understanding around definitions. Um, one definition in particular that I just wanted to highlight is when I talk about tobacco or when we talk about tobacco on the panel, I want to make sure that we know we're talking about commercial tobacco. And commercial tobacco products include cigarettes, they include e-cigarettes, hookah, cigars, smokeless tobacco. But when we talk about commercial tobacco, we are not talking about traditional tobacco, which is used by indigenous peoples. And it's used for sacred and ceremonial purposes. So I just want to make sure when we talk about tobacco, we're talking about commercial tobacco that is designed specifically for addiction and profit, not for ceremonial purposes that are sacred um, to their community. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our session, um, Policy Solutions for the Economic and Health Burdens of Tobacco Addiction. And as highlighted in the invitation, uh, tobacco costs us all dearly. There's probably not anyone in the room that doesn't either have a family member or friend that you may know that's been addicted, or if you are a parent or a grandparent, you may be hearing it from your kids or grandkids in terms of what they're seeing directly in the schools and what kids are truly contending with. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But what you should know is that tobacco use costs the state of Michigan $5 billion annually in lost productivity and health care costs. And the reason that's so critically important is as Michigan continues to court businesses and prospect itself for employment here, one of their biggest considerations is the cost of health insurance for their employees and their families. And as we know, that's a huge incentive for people to accept employment with an agency or an organization because of the costs associated with it. And when businesses are prospecting Michigan, not only are they looking at the $5.3 billion in associated health care costs with tobacco, but the other piece of that is a third of cancer deaths in Michigan are directly associated with tobacco. One third. So that's a pretty big number, and we know how to reverse that. So what I'm going to do today is um, invite you uh, later when you have cards on your table. If you have questions as I'm talking or, I'm, I'm, or the panelists are talking, I'd like you to jot down your questions. We're going to handle a couple questions or a few questions if you have them at the end of the session. But first, I'm going to take you through a few slides and outline the problem in Michigan, talk about our proposed solution, a little about what we've do, been doing in state, and then interview our two esteemed panelists. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to outline a little bit of the problem. So I'm going to draw your attention to this slide with the green, um, the green states. You'll see Michigan is highlighted here. And what you may not have heard about or know about is that Michigan is considered what's called tobacco nation. So Michigan is one of 12 states. You'll see there's three Midwest states. The rest are all in the south. And what that means is that Michigan is trending in the wrong direction in terms of use for tobacco use with adults and with kids. Rates are 30% higher in Michigan than other areas of the country coast to coast, which means Michiganders are dying earlier and at more risk of death and disease that's preventable. 
Tobacco's toll in Michigan, we talked about the five billion, but you should know is that 16,200 Michiganders die every year due to their tobacco use. And on the other end of that, the tobacco industry is spending an extraordinary amount of money to addict our kids, $23.5 million a day. That's not an annual number, that's every day the tobacco industry is spending money to addict Michigan kids. One thing that you may remember in the news, um, former President Trump actually um, is credited with raising the age of sale on tobacco to align with alcohol and recreational marijuana from 18 to 21. Michigan at the state level uh, has since aligned its sales age to match federal age. One thing President Trump also did in his tenure was a partial ban on flavored tobacco products, trying to remove products from the market that he thought at the time were appealing to kids. And we've been tracking that data since that happened to see what's happened in Michigan and how kids responded to that. And two things I'll point out on this slide. The 600% increase on the top right, 600% increase in flavored e-cigarette sales since that happened. So we know what happened is that kids migrated. The products that were being used that were now removed from the market, they simply migrated to another product. But importantly, that last bullet point is really what stands out to us. Um, this data is very recent in the last couple months. 1,700% increase in disposable tobacco products. I'm gonna show you a, few, a couple slides with photos of those. But the 1,700% increase in Michigan is really a standout compared to other states across the country and dominates the market here in Michigan. About 90% of the market is disposables compared to 57% at the national level. So that's, that really does stand out. If you don't have kids and grandkids and you haven't been in a convenience store recently other than to just pay at the pump, you may not have seen these products. Just a show of hands, do any of these look familiar to you? I can assure you if this was a room of 12 to 17 year olds, probably every hand would go up. So what you're looking at here on the left side is a vaping product. The right side is its caricature or companion product that the vaping product is intended to replicate or mirror. So those of you with kids and grandkids, you may recognize SpongeBob SquarePants on the left, on the top, and you probably do recognize the matcha frappuccino. Um, those are pretty popular at Starbucks. And then the other two, clearly, the tiger disposable vape and the, the pink cushy with the heart. Um, but those are actual products that have been photographed on the left side. So this is what kids are seeing today. This is what's enticing them. This is what the industry is claiming that adults use and kids do not. So I'll let you make your own conclusion. To, um, based on the photos. That's just a small set of them. Um, for context, there's over 15,000 flavored vaping products on the market today, 15,000. Michigan, um, what I will highlight in terms of the problem also, Michigan is one of nine states that do not require their retailers to have a license to sell tobacco. So unlike alcohol, unlike recreational marijuana, our retailers don't have to be licensed, one of nine states. So what happens with that is that our retailers have no consequence and adults are selling directly to kids. We think that's a problem, we hope you do too. Um, in Detroit, when we look at federal checks, this number, I, I've done this work for over 20 years. I had to refresh this number to make sure I didn't populate the fields incorrectly. Detroit has a 60% failure rate. 60% of the time, 12, 13, 14 year olds are walking into a store and successfully buying tobacco products. And what we know that's important related to that is that 95% of adult users started before the age of 21, 80% before 18. So the industry knows they need to get these products in the hands of kids really early. So they change the brain pathways and create a path for addiction to create those lifelong users. And that's what's happening here. Um, so that's really problematic. And I'll talk about our solution for this. Um, one thing I wanted to also highlight is the incredibly devastating impact on black communities. For those of you who are not familiar with the industry's aggressive marketing tactics, if we rewind the clock time-wise 30 years, about 5% of black Americans used, that who smoke used menthol cigarettes. That number today is around 85%. And that's not by mistake, that's by a very targeted marketing campaign. And it's incredibly important to our organization that we ensure that our policies are equitable and that they um, address these aggressive marketing tactics because black Americans are dying at a disproportionate rate due to that advertising and um, proliferation within black communities. So we are very committed to ensuring that menthol is part of this conversation when we talk about flavored tobacco. The last part of the problem I'll share. Our partner organization, American Lung Association, 
puts out a report card. You may or may not have seen this. They put this out for every state across the country. And this is Michigan's report card for 2024. If you do have kids or grandkids, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm wondering if this would be a report card if they brought it home, if you would reward them for this or be excited to see these C's, D's, and possibly F's. Um, it's certainly not a report card we love either. But what I will say is when I look at this report card, I see opportunity. I see places for improvement. And I know we can reverse these trends. It just takes public policy that we know is based in science and evidence to turn these Fs to As. And Michigan can do that. Michigan can go from last to leader. Um, and we do plan to do that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the solution. But that report card needs to look different in a can in 2025. So the solution. Uh, the solution that we are supporting is, and you may have seen or heard about it, the Protect Michigan Kids Bill package. What that package does is reverse those grades and those trends that we're seeing. It licenses. it requires that our retailers are licensed to sell tobacco and that there's consequences for adult business owners if they're not being lawful. In this bill package, it raises the price of tobacco products. The price of tobacco hasn't been increased in Michigan for 20 years. E-cigarettes, you may not know, are currently untaxed product in Michigan. It's one of just over a dozen states that doesn't do that currently. Um, Michigan is also tied for last in the country for its investment in tobacco prevention and funding. It's tied with West Virginia. So Michigan is paired right now with West Virginia for being last in the country to invest in uh, tobacco prevention and cessation and protecting our kids. We want that to look different too. Um, Senator Cherry's bill, ending the sale of flavored tobacco products. Those pictures that I showed you, that would pull those from the market. The industry claims those are adult users. We know they're not. We know predominantly they're being used by kids. This would take only off the market those products that are being used by kids. It would leave everything else on the market that's being used by adults who choose to, to remain tobacco users. The other two important parts of the bill that you may not be aware of, um, I mentioned we don't hold owners accountable, business owners who are selling to kids. Subsequent to that, we hold our kids accountable. So 12, 13, 14-year-olds are getting criminal penalties. They're being pulled from school. They're getting um, suspended. They're getting put into the criminal justice system at 12, 13, 14. We can be better mentors. We can be better role models. And we can set up the infrastructure differently to help create paths for success and hold the adults accountable who are unlawfully selling to our kids without accountability. We want that to look different. We want to protect our kids. And last but not least, Senator Schink's um, part of the bill package, incredibly important. Michigan is one of the most restrictive states in the country for disallowing cities or counties to work on tobacco control policy. So our cities and counties are left to wait for the state to do something if there's a crisis in their community. And we want that to look different. We want our city and county officials to work arm in arm in partnership with our state elected officials to make sure there's safety nets at all levels. And so repealing preemption is an incredibly part of this um, bill package so that we are able to do that. So our local officials have tools in their tool chest. Just going to highlight really quickly one slide or two. We wanted to know what the public thought about this bill package and what the support really looked like. So we did a poll late last summer, early fall, with the Glen Gariff Group, 800 sample size statewide. This next slide shows how people responded across the state of Michigan. Nearly 70%, and it's a pretty lengthy question if you're interested in it. I'm happy to show you if you geek out over numbers or polls. Um, the question was pretty long. It included everything in the bill package. We repeated it pre and post to make sure that people understood it. 70% of Michiganders support this policy change and really want our legislators enthusiastically to move this forward. When we look at the data, we look at age, we look at gender, we look at income, we look at education level, we look at how do people self-identify politically. This, these are the numbers. And this is like every one of those uh, differentiations I just mentioned. Um, our weakest number is from our strongly conservative self-identifiers, 60%. Very strong number, well over majority. Highest are strongly liberal Democrats, 78%. But this shows that this is bipartisan. People care about kids, and they want to see our kids protected, and they want our legislators to do that. So the, this poll is incredibly informative in terms of the compass for where we go next. So a couple slides in our campaign, then I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists. You may be seeing this in the news. Hopefully you are, either on your social, digital media, um, one of our speakers is shown here, Dr. Taylor's in this picture. 
Marquette, the Mining Journal, from the Alpena News to the Detroit News, we've been getting an incredible amount of coverage on this. People are really excited about the work that we're doing in the bug package and protecting kids. So we've gotten um, a lot of media attention around this, and hopefully that continues. Here you see some other activation um, work that we've been doing with local elected officials. The senator here is pictured with some parent advocates, Senator Cherry's town hall, some of our youth that have been involved, a lot of activity, a lot of activity. This is just a quick slide showing our resolutions of support. We've been getting an incredible amount of support. The Black Leadership Advisory Council, Detroit City Council, Council Member Scott Benson is the room, um, another public health hero in this work. Thank you, uh, Council Member Benson. Yeah, <laughs> go Detroit. Um, Royal Oak, you'll see the, these letters continue to build and the support is extraordinary. I didn't mention at the beginning, but our alliance that Brit, Dr. Taylor and I co-chair is comprised of well over 125 organizations statewide. Associations, school systems, public health systems, advocacy groups, all locked arm in arm to say, protect our kids. So we are very excited about the support. We're very excited that it continues to build. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our esteemed public health heroes, because we couldn't do any of this work organizationally without our partners. Um, so I'm going to introduce them both to you. First, I'll introduce Senator Schenck, and then we're going um, to we're going to have some dialogue with both of them, and invite you again to uh, write down any questions you may have. So Senator Schenck, um, Senator Sue Schenck is a community advocate, public servant, a mother, who has dedicated her adult life to building healthier, more resilient communities. She's serving her first term in Michigan in the Senate, where she is fighting for working families. Senator Schenck believes that government's role is to serve the people with skill, honesty, and integrity. Hailing from a proud union family, she grew up in southeastern Michigan, earned her bachelor's, master's, and law degrees from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Go blue, although that might not be popular, because I'm sure green, white are in the room, too. So apologies in advance. My, my kids went to Michigan State. So okay, all okay. All good. Um, prior to being elected to the Senate, Senator Shank served as chair of the Washington County Board of Commissioners and as a Northfield Township trustee, so brings to the table a lot of local experience. She was also chair of the Agriculture Land Preservation Advisory Committee, served as a member on the Huron River Watershed Council, as well as Washington County Food Policy Council. She lives in Northfield Township in a small farm with her husband, Tom, where they proudly raise their three daughters. And we're so excited to have you, Senator Shane. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Minu Jones. Uh, Minu is the founder and CEO of Making It Count Community Development Corporation. If you haven't heard of it, it's a black woman-led 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide meaningful opportunities that count towards making a difference in the overall equity and equality of all of its community members. Minu served previously as the CEO of the Black Caucus Foundation of Michigan. She has over 20 years of experience in the field of community development and public health. She wears many, many hats. I'm not only listing three here, but she has been zigzagging the country coast to coast working on this issue. Um, she's the chair of the Detroit Wayne Oakland Tobacco Free Coalition. She's a board member of the Tobacco Free Michigan. She's on the leadership team of the statewide coalition and the alliance that I mentioned. She's passionate about helping people of color build healthier communities. She's an inter internationally certified prevention specialist, alumni of Wayne State and Davenport Universities, and was recently last year awarded um, the Health and Racial Equity Partner Award by the National Network of Public Health Institutes. And I am grateful to call her a friend and a partner in this work. OK, let's get started for the, the exciting part and probably why you're all here. Um, I am going to interview our panelists or ask them some questions to share with you. And I'm going to start with you, Minu. All right. Um, so I provided the group with an overview of your expertise and experience. But I think we all do this work for a certain reason. So if you're comfortable, will you mind sharing your why? Yeah. Um, some of you may have heard my story. Uh, my why is personal. Um, I've lost several family members to tobacco-related disease. I lost my father um, in 2022 to COPD. Um, you know, he was a giant in my life. He was the person who walked to Chrysler um, glass plant um, just because he could. And, you know, to see him deteriorate um, was hard. I lost my grandmother to emphysema, my aunt to lung cancer, my 40-year-old cousin to throat cancer. Um, and I have a unique perspective. My mother 
worked for Stanley's Advertising. Um, and so in the 90s, when I was going to Cast Tech, Stanley's got a major contract uh, for tobacco products. And all they had to do was hand them out at the African World Festival. Um, at that time, minimum wage was $3.85. My mother could pay models, which were just people that she knew, um, $10 an hour. And they got, the pay they got paid at the end of every day. And as you can imagine, these young girls with gold plastic suits on with huge messenger bags full of true gold cigarettes in the heat of summer. They were just handing them out to everybody. And in fact, my aunt who died of lung cancer, uh, she was one of the workers and she was so excited because they let her take home a pallet of tobacco products. And they were in her den and she smoked herself literally to death. So when you hear about the stories about the tobacco industry deliberately targeting, targeting, targeting us, know that I saw it firsthand in my community. And it has to stop. Thanks, Pino. Senator Schink, I'll ask you the same question. Do you have a personal story? And what is your why? Yeah, and I have, I have a lot of whys. I'll share a few of them with you here. Um, I grew up in a house where my, my mom smoked. My dad didn't. He's never had a cigarette. Um, and my aunts would come over, and they would all smoke. And um, I would take pieces of paper and write, don't smoke, it will kill you, and glue them onto the ashtrays, which nobody appreciated. But I will say it's paying off at this moment, that activism that started way back when. And the thing is, is that my grandma, my grandma had, or sorry, she had asthma. My cousins had asthma. I have asthma. Um, and eventually, when I was in fifth grade, my grandma, who was the sweetest, kindest, most loving person in my life, died of emphysema and lung cancer. And I needed her. And she is gone. And my mom cried for a year. I'm still crying today. I still mm -hmm. miss her. And um, it was really hard on our family. She started smoking when she was a teenager. I have photographs of her. I mean, she's you know, a, different, a different generation in a fur coat with her cigarette looking so elegant. But it's not elegant. It's a trick. And eventually, uh, my, mom had, my mom quit. Um, but my other grandma died later. She had her lung removed while I was in law school. I went to visit her every day. My grades suffered, and it impacted my life. She, she ended up living a long life, but she would have lived a much longer life if she had not smoked. Mm -hmm. And she was so poor that her family did not always have food, but she went and bought cigarettes because she needed them, not because she wanted them, she needed them, and I know this because she told me that. And so those are some, some of the stories that impacted me. As a mother, I worried very much about my children smoking. We had a lot of conversations about smoking and why you wouldn't. There are all these other products now. Um, my daughter, who is a freshman at the University of Michigan, told me that she would go into the locker room where all the kids had to go and there would be kids vaping. There would be kids vaping in the bathroom. And then, because the teachers couldn't control the kids vaping, they would keep all the kids out of the bathroom. Yeah. So the kids couldn't even go to the bathroom when they needed to. And um, I've heard stories of their friends who started vaping because they had started smoking and they wanted to quit and they believed that vaping would help them quit. But the amount of nicotine is so much higher in the vapes that they're more addictive than the cigarettes. And so. I really appreciate being connected with you and you and, and getting to meet more parents across our communities because I've heard more stories about why it is so important that we stop this now because kids are just, as, as you were saying, as Jody was saying, um, they're entering the criminal justice system because they're addicted. And that's not fair. They're our children and we need to protect them. Thanks, Senator. Some of you um, may not realize, she was talking about the nicotine content, and I realized I didn't mention that, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with these products, one of those disposable um, pods that kids normally will use one to two a day is the amount of nicotine equivalency of a pack of cigarettes. 
So our kids that are vaping are vaping at the equivalent rate of a pack a, a pack or two a day smoker. And the first double lung transplant surgery actually on a 17 year old was performed at Henry Ford Hospital due to their vaping. So it's pretty extraordinary the impacts. Um, okay, Minu, I'm gonna um, switch to you. Help us understand what is at stake. I mean, lives, right? You talked about us being uh, in 50th place. Um, we lose 45,000 black lives uh, to tobacco each year. It's the number one killer of African Americans. Um, you know, and you think about all of the grandmothers, the grandfathers. Um, they started when they were kids mm -hmm. for the most part. So we have lives at stake. And, you know, unfortunately, because we don't have tobacco retailer licensing um, in Michigan, it's being left up to the grandmothers of Detroit mm -hmm. to police uh, these vape shops. And, you know, it's scary for me. I, I've worked in the field, like you said, for, for 20 years. Uh, I've seen the damage that the tobacco lobbyists have done uh, in Michigan. And we're at a unique point in time where we can change the trajectory of health in Michigan. And the fact that there are people who are still unaware of the issue and are still on the fence about it, it's scary. I agree. Senator Schenck, could you talk to us about some of the legislative work that you're doing on this policy package to move this conversation forward? Yes, thank you. I, I'm excited about all of the bills in the package. Together, they would take a giant step forward in protecting our children. We know from the work of other states that um, such as Massachusetts, New York, and California, that these kinds of laws don't hurt the economy and that they do reduce the vaping and, and the, the store owners are fine. Um, the bill that, that I'm sponsoring that would give local communities the control to make their own decisions would allow Council Member Benson to work with his community to come up with the solutions that make sense for his community. I'm from Washtenaw County, where our public health department for years has been raising the alarm about tobacco usage among children, but our public health department is powerless. Our county commissioners are powerless to do anything about it because the state has preempted their ability to do so, saying, hey, we'll take care of it. But the truth of the matter is, is Michigan is not taking care of it. Yeah. And we are threatening our economic and our health future our present, I'll just say that, it's not about our, it is about our future, but it's also about our present. When we're trying to attract some of the highest, uh, performing highest tech businesses in the world to, to our state, and they look and see that we are dead last in <laughs> youth tobacco prevention, why would they want to bring their families here? People care about those things. If I had a punctuation mark, I'd put an exclamation point, and my, many of them after that, many of them. Um, Minu, um, you've been working a lot on tobacco prevention policies in Wayne, Oakland County, where you um, do a lot of your work in Detroit. What happened in your experience in doing some of the recent policy work um, with council and the city attorney, if you want to share your story? Yeah, so um, thank you for that. Uh, I really believe in community-driven work. Um, and so, you know, we have the Detroit, Wayne, Oakland Tobacco Free Coalition. It's over 100 uh, members, um, local, state, national partners, and we drafted model policy language to introduce uh, to Detroit Corporation Council so that we could take a step towards health equity for the citizens of Detroit, Wayne, and Oakland counties. <laughs> and, you know, Corporation Council came back and said, oh, no, preemption disallows you from passing a ban um, on menthol and all flavored tobacco products. Our champion, uh, Scott Benson here, um, you know, has been doing God's work, um, but our hands are tied. And so, you know, hearing that no and knowing how much that could have done for my city 
that is by the Aspire uh, research group designated as a tobacco swamp, meaning that there is a tobacco retailer within a 10 minute walk of 85% of Detroit residents while we're a food desert, okay? And being hit with that wall, um, I'm not a person that takes no for answers. Detroiters, we are about grit. And so I looked at it as a challenge or a charge, an opening to really help protect all Michiganders, right? And so being able to pivot um, when we were told no because of preemption, which by the way, you should know that preemption slipped into Michigan's law at 4 a.m. on Christmas Eve 31 years ago, yeah. right? And you think about it as a legislator, as an elected official, what that would have been like. Yeah, it slipped in, you're trying to get home to your families. You know, so shifting and being able to have this historic eight bill package, I look at it as a win um, just to be able to do this work and get it as far as we've gotten it, but we have to get it over the finish line. So I'm, I'm thankful for for Sue, right? I'm thankful for you too. Yeah, I mean, doing it together. You know, we have to, we have to do it together. We've all experienced loss. It's not just a black problem, but it is a black problem. Um, and it's a problem for all Michiganders. And what Minu didn't mention, she mentioned the grandmother being responsible for taking policy into her own hands, but what Minu didn't share was that um, that's exactly what happened. It was her grandson that went into um, a Detroit retail location and successfully purchased, um, was it recreational marijuana? Mm -hmm. In a hookah tobacco shop. The grandmother, when he came home, went back and videoed the transaction and they sold again. And when they protested the store, the owner signed it to say, come visit our store a mile up the road. So the parents and grandparents followed them to that store. Since then, you've shut down five stores five. that there have been five. illegally and continually, despite complaints from parents and grandparents that this is happening, have shut down those stores due to those unlawful sales. But this shouldn't be left in the hands of our parents and grandparents. This really should be a policy that's designed to protect all kids, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of community and area in the state. So that's what we're really looking to do. Um, Senator Schink, here's a good question for you. What are some of the hurdles you see legislatively in the path forward? So you'd think this would be a no-brainer, right? Uh, huge economic losses, huge societal losses that we could prevent. We, we never have as much money as we want to invest in the good things that we want to invest in. And helping reduce the health costs and the lost work, the lost wages, that are due to tobacco use that starts when people are children would be huge for Michigan's economy. So you'd think it'd be a no-brainer. Um, I have received and rejected quite a few um, contributions from the tobacco companies. And I am going to guess that my, my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle are getting the same overtures. The, um, the businesses have said, oh, we're very afraid. But we know, we know that they will be fine if they stop selling to children because the stores that have stopped selling to children in other states are fine. And it's, it's not okay to make a profit off of addicting children. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think we're working our way through those hurdles. And I am very hopeful about what we will be able to do. Um, I know that um, the people in my caucus care very much about children. We're working on quite a few different policies to make life easier and better for families and their children. And so I am hopeful that we are going to get this across the finish line. Thank you. We are hopeful too. We share that hope. Um, Minu, what are your concerns at this stage and at this point? Well, if you all don't know me, um, I don't bullshit. <laughs> it's like I'm going to give it to you straight. My <laughs> My fear is that we don't get a hearing um, soon enough. I need us 
I need this to be heard. Uh, I've worked in this field, like I said, for 20 years. I've never experienced the type of uh, financial support, um, you know, the the people power, the the movement behind this that we're experiencing right now. Um, I feel like the people who truly care about health, um, they're all in, right? But we are up against an industry that pours $300 million um, into undoing the good work that people in public health have been doing every year. So my fear is that we don't get a hearing. My fear is that the tobacco industry continues to win and, and pays off people. Um, if you don't know, they you know tried to pay off Reverend Sheffield, mm -hmm. uh, local uh, reverend um, who was involved uh, in our coalition in this work. Um, he, like me, lost a parent um, to tobacco disease. Uh, text me 10 o'clock at night. Who are these people offering me $50,000? 100,000, 150,000. With, within less than an hour, the price went from $50,000 to $250,000. Uh, and he refused. But you think about the, you know, the economy. Um, and there are church pastors, uh, leaders, you know, who feel like, hey, I could take this money and do something good with it, right? But you're making a deal with the devil. It's, it's always going to be that way. And so I worry about, you know, those things. I, I tell people all the time, I don't have the money that the tobacco industry have, has. But what I do have is the truth and I have people power. And so I'm counting on people, regular Detroiters, the grandmothers, you know, mothers, uh, parents to, to step up and help me fight this battle. We have a big tobacco problem in Michigan. And we have a short abbreviated timeline in which to get it done. Yeah. Um, sooner legislators will be on summer break and then we're into election season. That's the reality. And then elections. And then um, depending on the outcome of the elections, we'll know what that compass looks like. But I think that's on all of our minds in terms of the amount of issues that our legislators have to contend with and what that laundry list looks like before the close of 2024. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, that concern is shared. Um, we'll do a couple more questions and then we'll see if any of you have questions. Um, Senator, who are some of the groups that have voiced support for these policies and what are you hearing in opposition? So I talked a little bit about the opposition and it's, uh, we heard some around equity. Oh, well, um, if this is going to hurt black and brown people disproportionately. But what I'm hearing from people who are actually black and brown is we need your help to, to keep our kids off of this addictive substance. And then also, um, I think it's important to note that one of the bills makes it so that children, it's, it, they're not criminalized, they're not punished for possessing these substances. It takes the onus off of them and puts it on the adults and, and expects the adults to act like adults because we know that kids act like kids. We know that they do what their friends suggest that they do. We know that they oftentimes don't see past the age of 18. They just don't, they're kids. So. Um, so we're, we're, we're acknowledging that. And so um, I have been meeting with a circle of advisors, parents, uh, school employees who, who work with children, who've experienced children going through this, and, and they are desperate for help. They cannot do this on their own, and they are asking us for help. And I've, I've met people from across uh, southern Michigan who have supported this work and who are, are trying really hard, and, and they just they need the legislature to act. So the Senator mentioned schools being a partner and an ally in this work, and she mentioned the bathroom issues. What you may not know is that some parents have been contending with kids coming home with bladder infections and urine infections, urinary tract infections, because they can't access the bathroom because they're telling their parents they're holding going the bathroom because they're afraid to go in to use the restroom because of the amount of vaping um, and illicit activity that's happening. School teachers are, are monitoring the hallways to make sure, you know, they're using the bathrooms or taking the doors off bathrooms. There's also a school in Michigan 
that um, their septic system was clogged because kids didn't want to get caught with the product and were flushing them down the toilet, which I know many of you probably have not heard those stories, but those are the stories that schools are contending with on the front end and on the back end, the cost associated with that, um, which is incredibly burdensome for our schools. So we, again, need to be working in partnership with our school officials to make sure um, that we're doing the necessary work to keep these out of the hands of kids. Um, Senator, do you think this is possible this year? It's putting you on the spot a little bit, but. Yeah. Well, if I weren't an optimist, I don't think I'd be in politics. But what I would say is that the Senate's been working very hard. And um, we have quite a few bills that are ready to go. And I think this one is, is, hasn't had a hearing yet, but I'm confident that we will. And that um, you know, before the end of this year that, that we can get these through, we do need we do need support, and we do need people to keep talking about them and, and showing their support. That's what we're here to do on our side. Yes, you so are. We are, we are and, and I would just say that uh, my colleagues and I are working very hard to bring back another majority so that we can keep up the, the business of Michigan. Um, there are so many bills that we have been passing because so much work has been left undone yeah. for the past 40 years, and Michigan does, Michiganders deserve the legislature to work professionally and get this work done. Yes, Michigan has waited a long time for <laughs> a long list. Um, Minu, last question for you, and then we'll see if there are a question or two in the audience. So this has been a long process, Minu. We've been working on this for a, a, a many years. So before we switch to questions from the audience, um, let's end on a positive note. Looking ahead, what, what brings you hope and optimism looking forward? Wow. Yeah, when I started this work, my hair was black. Seriously. Uh, what, what brings me hope, hope and optimism um, is that people, people are, are becoming more aware. You know, um, the amount of news coverage that we've been able to get in Detroit um, on shutting down those five uh, vape shops um, is unheard of. Yeah. Um, you know, on federal level, you know, we got some work to do, but but it's there, you know. Um, so those things get me um, get me excited, and um, I'm just looking forward to getting that hearing, um, the letters of support that we've received, um, the resolutions of support, Flint, Washtenaw, Ann Arbor, Detroit, Wayne, Oakland County. Um, you know, Muskegon, Berrien, um, mayors are stepping up, um, Black Leadership Advisory Council, right? We got a letter from them. They're stepping up. Um, so it, it's an exciting time uh, in, in tobacco control in Michigan. It really is. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll be able to get the hearing and, and push this over the finish line. I'm, I'm excited about my crown in heaven. My, my husband, he, you know, says to me, oh, my God, you, you're doing so much. It's so late. So da, 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 da. And I'm like, do you understand how shiny my crown is going to be? <laughs> I, like, we get to save so many lives through, the, through this policy change. It, you know, it, it's, it's really a blessing to be on, on this side doing this work. So... I'm excited about those things. It's a great way to end. Michigan kids are depending on, I think, all of us collectively. Um, thank you both. I, Brittany, Dr. Taylor, do we have any questions from cards or maybe one? Three minutes? Okay. So we can do. Okay. Yeah, if we don't get to all the questions, please do snag one of us, any of us. Okay. Um, Minu or Senator Shank, how can people in the audience help? I would love to take a stab at this one, so I uh, probably shouldn't use that analogy. But anyway, um, I was a grassroots activist before I uh, became elected, and I, I still am, I guess. I think the best thing that anybody in this room can do is to get your friends, your family, elected officials, uh, prominent people in the community to contact their elected officials, contact the governor, 
and let us know that you want these cha changes to Michigan law because that it, it really works. Um, I'm also thinking like, hey, we need a protest at the Capitol. I don't know if, if my colleagues want that. But um, <laughs> I think it's important to be open and obvious about support for these bills because they're really important. And I think uh, it can work to get this done. Um, yeah, we need, a, this is all, all hands on deck effort. Um, you know, it shouldn't surprise you that, uh, you know, the narrative gets confused about what, uh, what cultures want, right? What, um, what's good for black people, what's good for Native Americans, what's good for Arab Americans. And I really believe that most people in elected positions want to do the right thing. Right, but they the messaging, right, that's coming from the tobacco industry about oh, if you ban it, it'll put a black a target on black people's back and cause more police brutality. Oh, you know, uh, kids don't really smoke anymore. Like all the negative myths, the the misinformation that's out there. It's up to us to make sure that the voices of truth are being heard. So if you are a person of color, you know, you should be speaking up. If you are someone with kids, someone that's had a negative experience, we need your voices. You, you have, now is the time. You have to speak up. We can't be silenced and let the tobacco industry continue to bully us. So call everybody. You know, call everybody um, that you can possibly get hold of, especially the governor, and let her know that this matters. If we are about women, women's right, women's movement, you, you uh, women are, we're about our kids. You know, so you got to be with this issue. So are dads. So are dads. Dads too, fair enough. If you haven't looked in your incredible backpack that we all got, in that envelope in the backpack is your invitations for the week, QR code on here also. So if you want to know how to get involved and get help, scan this QR code, keep this with you, um, recycle it after if you don't need to keep it, but, um, but that's also a way to get more information. Megan, am I at time? We're at time. Okay. If you have questions, we'll hang out and kind of mill around. Do ask us, come up, approach any of us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for investing in this session and this dialogue. Um, we hope you have a wonderful conference.